one of the reasons that you get anemia with this disease, when you get anemia, is the red cells themselves destroy themselves. But then we have these other clinical presentations. I know I have a, a, a practice in a hospital in a uh, upper part of Manhattan. We see all of these presentations, not just anemia. So what? There, there's vasoocclusive crisis, right? What, what on earth is that? Tell me about vasoocclusive and then other, other issues that all of this produces. So the most common complication that we see in folks with sickle cell disease is the vasoocclusive crisis. These are these painful episodes where um, you have a blockage of the microcirculation and areas distal to the, to, the, to the blockage become hypoxic and you end up with pain. And that's the most common manifestation are these acute episodes of pain. And, and there's pulmonary hypertension, right? So uh, the next one I might move to is sort of from the acute stage is acute chest syndrome, which is the one we, we associate with a lot of mortality, another acute lung disease. Okay. Um, patients can get pulmonary hypertension. Um, there's, there's You're talking to an intensivist here. So yeah. This is I, I, <laughs> so, right, I, I, there are probably about 6% of patients with, with sickle cell disease will have pulmon pulmonary arterial hypertension. There are other forms of pulmonary hypertension mm -hmm. patients can get. We do things like like echoes, where we can um, where we can identify sort of echo defined pulmonary hypertension, okay. which we know is associated with morbidity mortality. Why do people with sickle disease? I'll just lump all of this together as sickle disease, if that's okay with you guys. Why do they have infectious disease issues? Why do they have problems? Since can can I say a little bit about the spleen? Sure. Since that is linked to, to the spleen, so one of the acute complications in children sickle cell disease when is when the spleen is affected. So two things can happen in the spleen. One, the spleen can die, and in fact, ninety percent of the kids with SS they lose the spleen by two years of age, and they're then you are really predisposed to infections from what we call encapsulated organisms, sure. right? So the main one is pneumococcus that causes a strep pneumo. <coughs> and then you can have pneumonia, you can have meningitis, and you can die of sepsis. And the other thing is spleen can grow, right? You can have splenic sequestration. And that is a severe complication that can kill the child. So since I'm a pediatric hematologist, this is one of the things that I, the two things that I do the most, the most first years of life is infection can kill your child, and splenic sequestration can kill a child. You know, if you start blocking the microcirculation, it occurs to me that end organs are all at risk, mm -hmm. whether it's yeah. kidney, microvascular, uh, the bones, avascular necrosis. Is this all of a pattern? Is it all from microvascular occlusion, or is there some other process going on? There's, there, there are so many downstream effects of having this abnormal hemoglobin. There's lots of endothelial dysfunction, right? Like you end up with strokes. Uh, there, there's a multitude, chronic inflammation. There's, it's considered a hypercoagulable state. So there are a multitude of complications associated with that. The vessels hemoglobin. are sick. I think it is really, I agree with Sophie. It's a, it's, a, it's a combination of several factors. Yeah, vessels are sick. The cells are sick. They're adhering to the endothelium. There's inflammation. There's hypercoagulation. And, and we're beginning to know that other cells are involved too. And that's I think right. that's going to be important yeah. when we talk about novel therapies that, the right, we, I think we've all grown up thinking, and some of us have grown up for longer, but I think we've all grown up thinking that it's all about the red cell. And I think it's important that we educate everybody about the, the newer knowledge right. that the white cells and platelets and endothelial cells are sick and right. play an yeah. important role. This is a systemic disease. I, I think it's important to separate out pain and sickle cell disease, okay. because um, their, their progressive disease may not be linked to their pain alone. So while pain is a severe complication, <clears throat> it, it, it is a, one of the symptoms, but there are many patients who can never have a, a pain crisis or a serious one, and when they become adults, they can develop severe renal failure, they can lose their hips, they can have a massive stroke, and their whole childhood was characterized as few episodes of pain. So the phenotypic expression of the disease actually separates into different categories, and patients who have relatively high hemoglobins tend to have up more pain, and those with very low hemoglobins have very few pain, but they have very progressive risk factors for early death. So pain is what the ER docs see, but when you look at the patients over time, the organ failure and death is really happening insidiously, asymptomatically to the yeah. patient. And you get lulled into this false sense that, that you're doing well. And patients often think they're doing well when, in fact, their because organs are quite affected. Crises, right. right, exactly. And so if you, if you look at a patient um, and you look at their quality of life, let me put them in the same two silos. 
if you'll permit me to do that. One is the pain silent, mm -hmm. which immediately and very loudly tells you we have a problem here. But insidiously, the other silo is going silently and destroying end organs, and eventually is the more damaging of the two. Is that fair? I think, you know, I, have, I heard this explanation from a patient that I thought was the best. He said, this is like having a house, and every day you lose um, uh, a brick from your house. And that's it. And you and can't tell day, until that last brick goes out. It's like Jenga, right? right? It's Wherever like Jenga, right? exactly, right? Yeah. Every day, one piece, but, but piece comes out. But I think there's a third silo when you talk to patients. Okay. So I hear you. It's, it's basal-occlusive pain. It's chronic organ damage. And we as clinicians worry about both. But I think if you speak to patients, um, they're worried about other things that are more practical, like okay. how they feel, their fatigue level, how much sleep they get, okay. chronic pain. Uh, there are a lot memory being able to, their cognitive function. So patients are telling us that it's not just about VOCs and they're learning more and more about the importance of chronic organ damage, but if you ask them, they're in a third silo. I'll tell you that as a clinician who doesn't specialize in this, it's always been my sneaky suspicion that it's not basal-occlusive disease alone. There's something else going on with this disease. No, there, there's a lot of pathologic effects that are downstream from the mutation and the membrane stimulating thrombosis, inflammation, a, a lot of biologic changes. I actually think sickle cell would be a totally different treatable, treating disease if the medical community wasn't only focused on pain. Mm -hmm. And so when they, in the emergency room or some other things, they characterize the patient in terms of how they do with their pain, and they don't address these other medical problems. It. And it really, res actually, so if in a lot of ways, if pain wasn't the problem, I think the enormous brain injury that sickle cell patients have, both focal and non-focal, and progressive neurocognitive decline, would be better treated because they would see it as a neurodegenerative disease. With all Let's, let's take a look at our ER colleagues where a lot of these folks get seen for lack of a better place to go. They're swamped mm -hmm. and they're there to take care of an acute issue which is often pain. And they're not there in their view to cover the waterfront of all these other issues which is why there's a, a gap it seems to me in the care of sickle patients. 